When Israel was attacked on October 7th, a lot of people heard for the first time the word kibbutz. So today you're going to hear some history of the kibbutzes in Israel and how these communities are dealing with the war that's just a couple of miles away on the Lebanese border. What is a kibbutz, you ask? It's a good question. Let me start with some history. Kibbutz is a Hebrew word that means gathering or a commune. The first kibbutz was opened in 1910. In 1989, at the peak of the kibbutz movement, there were over 120,000 people living in these communities. Today, there are still 200 plus kibbutz communities all around Israel, mostly Upper Galilee in the north, and then the south and the Egyptian and Gaza border, because this is where most of the agricultural lands are, and that's what kibbutzes do most of the time. Originally, everything in the kibbutz was shared. Everybody did their part, they did the work, and they got what they needed. All the kids were taken care of, there were communal kindergartens and schools, everybody ate together, and everybody had a place to stay. Things have changed a lot since then, and kibbutzes are no longer these communal properties where everybody has to do something for the good of the kibbutz. You can now buy property in the kibbutz or buy a piece of land and build your own uh, house there and move in. In order to move into a kibbutz, you have to pay some money to become a kibbutz member, and they also decide whether to let you in because not just anybody can become part of their community. So there's a shared budget that gets spent on improving the, uh, the infrastructure in the kibbutz, there's roads to, to maintain, there's a peripheral fence, there's people working for the kibbutz, there's a head of the community, there's a leader. They all come together, they decide, they vote on things. For example, I was in a kibbutz uh, the other day, a kibbutz up north in, in the Upper Galilee, and I heard this story from a mother who lost her uh, soldier son. He was serving in the army before the October 7th attacks, and when everything happened, he got moved into the, the Gaza area to protect those kibbutzes that are getting attacked. And he and six of his friends died in a battle to, to protect one of the one of those communities. According to his mother, the last time that they spoke, he told her his last wish if he were to die in battle. He asked her to remember him, not by putting up a monument or anything, but by doing something meaningful for the community. So the day that they got word that he was killed in battle, they decided to organize a program uh, for, for youth in their kibbutz and the different uh, kibbutzes nearby. An army prep program, there's a lot of these. Actually, I talked about the, the Arameans up north in the, in the Upper Galilee. They have a, a, an army prep program where they, can, they bring together Jews and Christian Arabs so they can learn from each other. There are different types of uh, army prep programs for youth, and they decided to open one up in their community. So they needed a, a location, a, a little venue for that. They bring in 40 up to 50 uh, youth uh, now for that program, and they serve in the community, they volunteer, they learn, they, they train, and, and they get ready for um, the army. So in order to get that venue from the kibbutz, they made a petition to the kibbutz government and everybody voted, and it was a landslide vote to let them use this, this facility for this program. So it still works as a self-contained uh, communal government type thing where everybody decides, but not everybody does the same amount of work. If you decide not to do any work for the community, but just pay the, the fee, and there's, there's gotta be monthly fees, and there's gotta be different, um, collections that they, they uh, organize for the needs of the community. So as long as you participate in that, then I guess that, that's the only responsibility you have with the community, but you don't have to do work in the place. So this particular kibbutz with the army prep program to honor the memory of the fallen soldier. It's a pretty big community, about 1300 people. They live in a really nice place. Lots of greenery, beautiful scenery. You have the Mount Hermon right in front of them. They're taking care of their kibbutz. They're doing projects. They have a school right across the way in a neighboring kibbutz. They're friends with uh, all these area kibbutzes. They're doing good. They're strong. Um, they live right on the edge of the uh, Jordan River. It's a beautiful place. Uh, the, the Jordan River beach that they have they call paradise. So kids will tell each other, hey, do you want to go to paradise to swim? They do that. So it's a beautiful place, everything's going good, and then the war starts. And 
we don't know what to expect. And Hezbollah starts firing rockets and all the armies tied up in the south with Gaza. And nobody really knows what is going to happen. So a lot of people start leaving to eva evacuating to, uh, to save their families. The government decides to evacuate everybody that is in the three kilometer buffer from the Lebanon border south. This kibbutz is 3.2 kilometers, just, just a, a few hundred yards outside of that range. So basically they don't get evacuated. I previously told a story about evacuations and what people go through. So check that out. So if the government evacuates you, they put you up in a hotel and they basically pay the bills for you to stay there. Of course, there's a lot of other problems and you don't, you're out of your element and you're with, you're cramped up in your, in, in one hotel room with your whole family and you're not working for months at a time. So it's a whole other thing. But these people didn't get evacuated and they got to stay in their, in their kibbutz. So the families that did leave the kibbutz, they felt safer elsewhere and they went and stayed somewhere for a period of time. Um, some came back, some didn't. So half the population of the kibbutz a year later is still gone and it's hard to know whether they'll ever come back. But the leadership in the kibbutz has not given up. They're still working, they're still protecting the families that are there. And they're still, even though it may not be the best time right now, but they're reaching out to others. Like this new army prep program that they started, it brings in new people. And whenever there's young people in the kibbutz, they make families and they end up moving there, building a house and, and uh, growing uh, the population and, and having kids there and raising their kids up in, in the kibbutz. So it's very important to bring new people. So there's different projects that they're thinking of to protect the people that are still there and to offer new people to come and become members in their kibbutz. So back to when the war started, they lose about a thousand people. What do they do? One of the options is to evacuate completely but they decide not to do that. They decide to stay, stand their ground, protect the families that are still there, make sure that they have a kibbutz to come back to for, for those that have left. They started working on the infrastructure, putting up new flags, freshening the place up, making sure that's even more beautiful than before, and of course, protecting. They all take turns. They have this bunker that they set up. They have shifts for people to come and watch the cameras and, and be on the lookout. They installed all, all these new cameras around the kibbutz. So everybody that was left in the kibbutz, they actually went back to what a kibbutz was originally like. They all chipped in, they all put in their part. They all worked uh, doing everything that needed to be done, even though not everybody carries a gun and not everybody knows how to use a computer. There's a lady there, she's 80 years old, or 81 even years old, an American lady from Manhattan that's lived in this kibbutz for like 40 plus years, uh, raised her family there. One of her sons uh, came back and, and built a house there and lives there. And she volunteers and she cleans and she brings food and she, um, and she calls people up to let them know what, what, what's needed. Everybody chips in and everybody does their part. And the kibbutz is stronger than ever, even though they're they're about half of the population. The attitude is so great. They're all happy. They're all smiling. Even though there's bombs every day, they were telling me stories. They're washing dishes and the Iron Dome starts intercepting rockets coming in. And they listen for the, for the instructions from the home, command, home front command. And, oh, okay, it's only, it's 500 yards away from us. It's no big deal. We just carry on. They're still in the war zone. There's still danger every day. But they've learned to live with it and they learn to be happy with it because they're a community, because they've stuck together. And that, finding hope in that, they give hope to others. And I think that's the takeaway for all of us. Finding hope in everything that's happening around us, there's a way to do it. These guys have shown us. And even if you're 80 years old, you can do your part. And that's the story for today. Come back tomorrow and I'll tell you another one.